Hi, my name's Alex and welcome to 52 Miniatures. If you're new to this channel, there's something I'd like to mention. I don't think I can teach you much about how to paint, but I do hope I can be around to keep you company whilst you try. Seldom, for me, is having a hobby a straightforward learning experience. It's more like a crash test dummy's memoir on motion. At the end, as we hit the wall, we might just learn something that will improve our survival chances when in the next crash. Lazy Squire Games, I think I should call them friends by now, reached out and asked if I'd like to check out one of their ventures. The Legend of Keepers, a Kickstarter campaign together with Scott Taylor of Art of the Genre. Computer game The Legend of Keepers turned into a D&D reverse dungeon campaign book as well as miniature STLs and printable dungeon terrain. This is nerd speak for a lot of stuff that looks cool and you probably need it. And it does look cool. For me it's mainly about the miniatures, as I'm a miniatures man. The original imagination gone into the computer game versions of characters that then have been translated into sculpts feels like an ongoing story, originality with good storytelling and stunning visuals. And Reverse Dungeon is rather cool. I didn't know anything about it before this. You actually play the monsters defending the dungeon against annoying, intrusive heroes. This is great news for me. Uh, goblins for the win, right? Something I've begun to appreciate from dedicated D&D stuff is the need for variety. I come very much from a wargaming side of things. If there is interest in, let's say, goblins, well, one buys 150 goblins for an army. Yet with the skirmish games I've recently been interested in, like the Silver Bayonet from Osprey Games as one example, all of a sudden I need a few random monsters. Like one goblin, or one skeleton, or whatever. And here we are, D&D Goldmine. Because of the goldmine, the variety, choosing what to paint was difficult, but also not. You know when you go into a game store, wandering down the shelves and all of a sudden stop. Somewhere deep inside you know that the meaning in front of you is what you're going to leave the store with. Even if you're not quite sure what you're going to use it for. That's the mini I'll be painting for the majority of this video. The Enchantress. I did print out more as well to get a better look at the miniatures that for me were enticing in some way. I think I picked the quote unquote simple sculpts a lot of the time, says something about me, but also something about the character design. Creating simple yet good minis, minis that tell a little story, I don't think that's a simple task. I'll be painting some of these too, later on in the video. But first back to the crash test dummy experience. The Enchantress I want to paint is a large miniature, a swirling sculpt that is both beautiful and a little scary. If I were to paint it full on every swirl and detail, it would take a long time indeed. I'm not a fast painter. And I kind of want this on the table soonish. Yet the organic shapes talk to me, begging for something special. Is she in your head too? I decided to experiment with new for me techniques and paints to see if I could make something special out of this without spending several weeks trying. I'm going to experiment with a combination of working with oil paints and acrylics, using the benefits of either paints to help bring the Enchantress to life. Let's see how hard the wall hits this time. First off was my regular starting point, a Zenithal Prime. The bright spray over a dark primer brings out details and give a sort of light map of highlights and shadows. A Zenithal Prime can be done with an airbrush or rattle can. Spraying a bright, in this case white spray from above at a slight angle over the dark, in this case black, primed miniature. This gives us a great look at details and reveals the quality of the sculpt. Many have adopted the now so-called slap shop method of painting, using transparent paints over a Zenithal primed miniature. I tend to often just use the Zenithal prime as a guide, a mental or by use of camera physical image of shadows and highlights. Painting over the Zenithal Prime, covering it with opaque paints but that are lighter or darker corresponding to the Zenithal underneath. Also, I just love the Zenithal look. It inspires me to paint for some reason. A lot more so than a black primer. I've got difficulties visualizing without the Zenithal perhaps. And honestly, sometimes the right technique is the one that inspires. 
From this Zenithal Prime, I can go on and work in colors with the airbrush. I'm going for a muted nature type thing, brown, green, tinted with violet reds, uh, magentas, uh, blues. As a footnote, I think this scheme would work well for the Sylvaneth from Games Workshop. The reddish tones complement the greens very well and so do the blue. The blue for me also works as a magical colour, something that tells us that this is in fact not a normal tree. It does in fact have nipples, uh, a magic wand, and will probably turn you into a newt any second now. And brown just works with everything. Love brown for that. The airbrush layer of paint will help the oil paint along, and help me along, like a zenithal prime in colour. But also now all of the mini has colour on it. Whatever comes ahead does not need to cover everything, only the important bits. Efficient, I hope. Why oil paints? Well, honestly, why not? And yeah, welcome to crash test land. Leave your helmet by the door. Uh, but no, seriously, I'll tell you some rather deep thoughts on the matter, but first I want to tell you what I'm doing, without this becoming too much of a tutorial. I try to mix oil paints to roughly match the acrylic paints I use through the airbrush. Oil paints can be both transparent or opaque, depending on the pigment that makes up the paint. So I try to organize my palette with opaque paints on the right hand side and transparent on the left. The order is of no importance and only corresponds with some kind of inner personal logic. To get covering layers of paint, I need to make sure I put something from the right hand side in with the paints on the left hand side. This is a step we don't have to think about with regular miniature hobby type paints because someone has already done that step for us. With artist style, single pigment paints, the transparent or opaque thing is something necessary to acknowledge, even with acrylics. I'd say when one gets used to it, it's uh, fun, uh, beneficial, exciting and sometimes on some days too much work. Once I have my paints in order, all diluted with a bit of white spirit, I start kind of painting backwards, starting with the highlights, not being meticulous at all, and then move down to the mid-tones, kind of just smudging paint on, avoiding the white spirit as much as I can. Instead, when I need to clean my brush, I wipe it clean on a tissue. When the different paint segments are done, I start feathering the two layers together, creating gradients not only between colors, but also between highlights and mid-tones. One of the benefits with oil paints is that it does not dry fast. We can blend all day. How often, when painting with acrylics, can you pick up the phone mid-painting to then go back to work on the same gradient with the same paint on the brush once you're done talking? Anyway, after all that feathering, I carefully go back and try to fiddle in some more highlights and some more colors here and there, carefully smudging and blending in paint, trying to work on paint as thin as I can. Sometimes difficult with oil paints, that. And now, for some quack philosophy. I'm just a guy in a bunker, after all. A lot of what goes on right now in the hobby, apart from warlord titans, is about getting told how to do things. To do things right. And what a marvel of an opportunity. All these peers teaching us their knowledge, for free. Even companies making free content on how to best approach miniature painting. But I sense a slight, uh, well, risk is maybe too strong a word. Apprehension, maybe? Here is an option you might like. It does not sell products or get views. Instead, the best or the only way to do something is for some reason what gets us to click. Or even worse, you're doing it wrong. I'm not trying to be rude or accusing. Uh, please join my patron. I just think we are potentially, unintentionally, creating an environment where there are only a few acceptable ways to do things. Because it's sold to be the right way, or the only way. Instead of using techniques or paints that might suit how or what it is we are painting, or who is painting, we instead stick to what we get told is the best way to go about things. When there are in fact lots of different ways to paint, with lots of different paints, by lots of different painters and styles. This is not an attack, and I'm not saying we should not learn, develop, progress, and pay attention to peers. I'm not complaining. I just want to talk about it. Thinking out loud with maybe just a bit of annoyance in my voice in regards to the difference between an encouraging workshop vibe and the you are doing things wrong thumbnail, or the new paint that will change your life campaign. 
And what in the devil's third eye does this have to do with my lovely enchantress? Well, I wanted to use oil paints, not because I think everyone should use them all the time, not because I think it's the only way to paint her, but because I thought it would fit the shape and style of the miniature, and maybe render me swifter results than trying to achieve a similar result with acrylic paint. The flowing, growing, organic style, blending green into red into brown into blue. Using oil paint seemed practical whilst adding an organic look to an organic miniature. After the rather smudgy but lovely looking layer of oil paint was done, I placed the miniature on a radiator overnight with a fan in front of it. The warm and circulating air will speed up drying times in my damp basement. And the day after, the thin layers of oil paint felt dry to the touch. I now wanted to use acrylic paints to paint sharper details where needed, something I find difficult with oil paint. Acrylic paint, to me, feels more precise off the brush than oil paints do. There is a fork in the road here. A layer of varnish would make sure the acrylic paint acts like it should. I mean, it still can, but varnish would make sure. But I wanted to test just painting straight on the dry oil paint, saving me several hours more of waiting for varnish to dry. This was kind of a little mistake. Certain things worked out fine, but I noticed that the paint did not act as I'm used to. Next time, I will most probably varnish. I now tried to mix acrylic paints to match the oil paints, full circle. I did some layering and edge style highlights, but also glazing in some stronger colors where I thought the oil paints had muted down a bit too much uh, when drying. This is the stage when I realized that the blue was awesome and I wanted more of it. Sometimes a paint job can sort of come to you mid painting if you let it. Now for the next strange move, I went back to oil paints, this time oil washes. I felt everything was lacking a bit of depth and definition. Washes might help, but I had to be careful. The white spirit in the oil wash will reactivate the original oil paint. So light hands on deck. Once more, I could have done that layer of varnish, but I just felt like breaking the rules. Stand up against all the you should haves. And I mean, I'm still here today, able to tell this tale. And I was on a roll. That felt important and inspiring. Apart from a dark brown to almost black oil wash on the Enchantress and her great base, I also mixed a wash out of an opaque blue oil paint. Remember I was talking about the transparent and the opaque pigments? Well, the transparent ones, for me, make good traditional washes, for the most part. The opaque ones I can use for other effects, like blue magic effects. The opaque pigment will now settle in the recesses, creating an almost OSL-like feel of blue magic radiating from the inside of the tree. Pretty cool. It was now time for letting things to dry again, and I figured I wanted to try something on some of the other miniatures. I keep trying to figure out ways to paint swifter, while still enjoying the process as well as the result. Much of my enjoyment in painting comes from spending a lot of time on each miniature. I wouldn't really mind that if someone hadn't invented armies. So I had a thing I wanted to try out, well two actually, the constant search for the holy grail of grim dark speed painting. Step one, Zenithal Prime. Step two, dry brush out the finer detail. Step 3. Paint on the metallic paint on the metallic -y bits. Metallic paints I despise, in general. I think mainly out of principle, nowadays. Probably time to shape up. But yeah, uh, gots to love the Orgoth bronze. Uh, the colour of it, anyway. Step 4. Making a rather thin lamp black oil wash. Maybe one part paint to ten parts white spirit. Step 5. Cover the miniature entirely, all of it, with the wash. Step six, clean up as many raised bits as possible by use of sponge and Q-tips moistened in white spirits. Step seven, wish I would have varnished first so that everything wouldn't have been stained. Um, step eight, go to my game store and buy my first uh, contrast paints. Well, I mean, not really. And, oh, by the way, all hail Alpha Spill, the best game store around. Anyway, I did have some contrast paints previously to this and liked none of them apart from the black. The black Templar I use on every other paint job. But the other ones, the two blue ones I have, exactly the same, only one is thinner than the other. A grey one that I don't like and, you know, I'm not impressed. 
And so I thought I should really give these paints another shot. So many people swear by them and adore them. Uh, so uh, I got a bunch. Paints I thought looked nice on the rack and some I've heard people use. My line of thought here is if I deepen the darkness, so to speak, on the miniature before adding the transparent paint, things should become more dramatic and grim and dark, but still keep its vibrancy. Something that can get lost if I added the black wash at the end of the process. I mean, you can see the difference with the Zenithal Prime versus the Zenithal Prime with the oil wash. Pretty dramatic. My first paint was fittingly wild wood for the wild wood creature. And that just kind of darkened everything down. Not much colour was achieved and... Okay, on to the next one. A Garen's something uh, Junes. I can swear it did not look like this on the colour example on the Games Workshop shelf. And I mean, this is exactly like snakebite leather, only thinner. And yes, I bought snakebite leather too, and so now I feel ripped off. This is exactly like with the two blue paints I bought previously. They're the same colour, only one is more diluted with medium. The Baal Red was in fact Baal Pink. Uh, why call it red if what happens is pink? And by now, you can sort of start to decipher that I was uh, yet again disappointed in contrast paints, and instead resorted to covering things up with regular opaque paints. Mind you, the new yellow contrast paint seemed good, but apart from that, I just don't know what it is. I feel out of place. Everyone is using this stuff, yet I cannot get it to work. Maybe I just don't like the aesthetic? I don't know. But it makes me think about what I was talking about earlier, how we get pushed certain ideas, examples of how well techniques and paints work out and all that. But in the end, maybe certain things work out for certain painters, all with different tastes and aesthetics in mind. Oil paints are maybe not for everyone, and contrast paints are maybe not for everyone, but you will never know until you try, uh, probably more than once. I guess I just have to keep trying with the contrast paints then. Overall, my grim dark look with the black oil paint didn't work so well with the paints I used. A lot of them were in fact not transparent enough, brightening up the black in the undercoat. And they did not pack enough punch in the saturation department. I'm going to try this again at some point, but maybe use other transparent paint options instead. There's a lot of miniatures in this Kickstarter that to me look different. Great sculpt, but also original sculpt. If you're into D&D, then this is a bountiful, the campaign, the terrain, but also for the miniature painters and collectors of STLs, there is pledge levels for STLs only. The Legend of Keepers 5e Reverse Dungeon Campaign Book is a 350 plus page tome containing four unique dungeons, STL models of 24 playable heroes, 50 plus playable monsters, 12 notorious monster bosses and rules for three ways to play 5e, traditional, evil and PvP. This campaign is also offering 200 STLs from Stonecraft Dungeon, Lazy Squire Games' new line of 3D printable terrain. Please check out the link to the Kickstarter in the description for more details and more fun. My last visual deceit on the Enchantress was to add a bucket load of pigment powder to the scenic base. This was kind of my plan from the start to save time. It works well visually, I think. Stronger colours and more precise painting on her body, the important bit, and a more diffuse mood uh, setting base. The eye gets drawn up to the sharp contrast up top, and yet the mossy forest floor feels right somehow. Not like I neglected it. I fasten the pigment powder in place with white spirit, and once that's dry, I might repeat the process until I like how things look. The final step is then varnishing everything with a matte varnish. This makes all the different types of paint, some with different types of shine, appear as one. I mean, there was not too much of a crash. Maybe something like a crash test dummy on the bicycle experience. I had fun painting the Enchantress. It kind of has that organic feel I hoped for. I definitely learned a few things. The approach I had on the smaller miniatures definitely needs some work. Looking forward to that. I want to thank Lazy Squire Games for sponsoring this video, supporting creators like me. I can't say too much, but I have been involved in one of the pledge levels for the Kickstarter. For me, a very cool experience that I look forward to sharing in the future. Also, a great reason to follow the Kickstarter. I also want, as always, to end with a great thank you to my dear patrons. Thanks for watching. Bye.
Thank you.